Joining us, beautiful formal day. What a you go back. You know, glad that you could take some time to join us at the Historical Society. As always, we'll begin with the pledge. the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So, before we start with our program, just some uh, notes for the coming months. Uh, November 13th at 2 p.m. we'll be joined by Dick Woodgio. Dick is a historian um, and is also a trustee with the Green County Historical Society. And he will be giving a talk on the history of beer brewing and the arrival of beer, beer in the Hudson Valley, as well as Peter Bronk, who was a brewer from Beverwick, Albany, uh, who built the uh, stone portion of the uh, 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 Bronk House down in uh, uh, Kuksaki. Uh, Peter was a brewer for the Patroon. And uh, when taxes got to be too high in Albany, he left town and went down uh, to do his own thing down in uh, down Kuksaki. Uh, Dick uh, reenacts Peter Brown, although he won't be. I asked him if he wanted to if he wanted me to have his, wear his pantaloons. I said no, that's probably too much for everybody. Uh, so he's going to be doing a talk on the history of brewing. And for the first time, we're actually linking uh, that talk. We're going to have uh, um, Rail to River Brewery, which is as far as we've been able to figure out, the only brewery that's ever opened in the town of Queens, a uh, new brewery down in uh, Ravina, they're going to be joining us and they'll be uh, pouring some samples. So I'm sure we'll fill every seat now that so they'll be free beer. Uh, but we thought it'd be a great nexus. So they'll talk a little about their brewing probably right after Dick finishes and it should be a fun afternoon. Uh, December 11th, 1 to 3 is our uh, annual open house. Uh, hopefully, if uh, COVID stays away and there's no monkey box, we'll all be able to get together again uh, December 11th. Uh, it's also our kickoff to the town's 350th anniversary, as well as the 25th anniversary of uh, this organization's founding. So 2023 is an important year in the town, both for the town and for us. Uh, so we'll be kicking off that celebration with our open house. We will be unveiling uh, several new uh, exhibitry panels on uh, some new exhibits as well. So it's a great day to stop in, uh, greet each other, have a nice conversation, and see what's new in the organization. So with that, I want to welcome our speaker, Lovada Nahan. Uh, uh, Lovada is going to be uh, giving her talk, Dining Dutch in the New World. She's an interpreter of African American history with the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation's Bureau of Historic Sites. She's a culinary historian focused on 17th through 19th century uh, mid-Atlantic region with an emphasis on the work of enslaved cooks in the homes of the elite class. Uh, she's also a generalist in New York's African-American history from the 19th century through the 20th century. And she has more than 20 years of public history experience working in a variety of historic sites, uh, societies, and museums across the tri-state tri region I couldn't be happier to uh, uh, invite uh, Lovada to join the podium and uh, have the talk begin. Lovada, thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. This program that I'm going to share with you today. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. Here we go. Uh, the program that I'm going to share with you today is actually I've been working on it for a while. It is, is there a way to turn this down? I feel like I'm very loud. Okay. Um, I used to do specific programs for every time somebody asked me to do a program, right? And then I realized I was making multiple copies of the same program. So I've been working on this one and I've kind of been tweaking it a bit. So we're going to go through it, and then they're like, if you have other questions, I have, I think, a few more slides past the thank you, and then questions, and we'll see how it goes. So Dining Dutch, I said initially in the New World, but that's like really broad, because then that puts the Dutch in Brazil, that puts the Dutch in other places. So we're going to do Dining Dutch in New Netherlands.
It includes and is part of the 17th through 18th century New Netherland to New York. And that's important because there is a shift when we go from Dutch to British. So we're going to expand a little bit on that. We're going to go through an overview of what is culinary history. And then where do we start? We're going to look at the American education system and then briefly go through some research and material culture. And I just realized I have this printed out so I don't have to constantly flip back to this slide. So we'll add this to the poem. We hear often related to food two terms, food history and culinary history, or as some people say, culinary history. So what is the difference? Food history is if you're talking about, say, an onion. I'm going to tell you where the onion is from, and I'm going to tell you about the onion. But that's all. I'm not going to talk to you about onion recipes. I'm not going to talk to you about onions as a trade item. I'm not going to talk to you about how they're stored or anything like that. I'm just going to talk to you like this is where it was and this is where it ended up. Kind of like straight item history. When we speak of culinary history, we talk about everything and information on the onion, right? The culture of the people who grew onions. Whether that onion became a native, is it native to where it is, or is an imported ingredient somewhere else. Uh, we talk about the home, we talk about professions, gardening, preservation, husbandry, eating practices. I mean, how many different ways can you eat an onion? You'd be surprised. Um, hosting practices, restaurants, terrorists, everything that has to do with food. Not just the food item, not just that one ingredient item. So that's why I am a culinary historian, not a food historian. Because right? you can get a book on just vanilla or a book on just saffron or something like that. So one of the things that is our starting point is all the stuff we learned in school. Many of us going through school, when we talked about the colonial period, it was all about the British, right? And then we didn't really talk about the Dutch. So that's where we really have to start. The array of foods and spices, right? The Dutch were like major. They had this major impact. So we're gonna come back to this slide in a few minutes. Again, I'm working out slide order here. So I want to go to what we learned in school. Now, I am not a native New Yorker. I am a New Yorker by choice. I've been here since I was 24. I've lived here longer than I ever lived in Texas, so I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah. But growing up, I learned 13 colonies north and south. I didn't hear anything about this mid-Atlantic stuff, right? It was just two. When in fact there are three. There's the south, there's the middle, there's the north. So we have British, British, and then we have this Dutch thing stuck in the middle. New Netherlands. It is really important that we keep these three areas in mind, particularly when we're talking about food. Because it's not just the culture of the colonizer that is important. It's also about temperate zone, right? If you're a gardener, you know temperate zone. As I said, I'm originally from Texas. And I have been duped by southern vegetables coming up here, trying to be grown here. One was a thing called a purple hull pea. I'll never forget this. I was at the Grand Army Plaza 
in Brooklyn at this beautiful farmer's market and they had this huge bushels of purple hull peas and I was like, yes, fresh peas in the sun. I spent way too much money per pound. I got home and I like clear my afternoon. I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna shell me some peas and watch a movie. And it was hull after fatty hull after fatty hull and no peas. <laughs> They looked good, but our season is not hot enough. The peas were these little tiny things, <laughs> wanting to absorb all that fatness in the hull and never made it, right? So we really have to keep that in mind because that also impacts the presence or absence of quote unquote soul food when it comes to African Americans here in New York. So let's set it up, make sure we're all got this base. I'm sure all of you are deep into the Dutch. But a lot of people don't realize New Netherland is right in track with all of these British colonies, right? Right now we're all deep into Jamestown, but seven years later, right? New Netherland is founded. We all know about the 1619 Project, 1625, the first men of African descent were purchased as enslaved people in New Amsterdam. Very few people know that. And a main difference between those British colonies and the middle colonies, because we all learned about how they starved in Jamestown. We all learned about those pilgrims who had all that food all around them and couldn't eat because they were all city folk. And suddenly they're out in the wilderness. They can't recognize food that's not in a market stall. We don't have food shortages here. We have a people shortage. And this people shortage lasts well into the 18th century. But particularly during the Dutch period. And it is that people shortage that sets up the third type of agricultural system that is used during the colonial period. We learned about those New England family farms and we learned about those southern plantations. Very few of us learned about the patroon system. Very few of us learned about the manor system. Very few of us learned about the large farms that emulated those systems. So what is a patroonship? Well, let's go back to our founding. We're Dutch. But we were not started by a royal house. We were not started by a crown. We were started by a company. And a company that was looking for profit a company that was only interested in profit, right? But the men they had here in the fur trade said, yo, we need support, we need community, we need people around us. You guys gotta do better than this. We can't do this fur trading thing by ourselves. We're not gonna go live with the natives. Fix it. So the Dutch West India's company's solution was to offer large tracts of land to very few people, which they had to pay for, and allowed that person then to take care of getting that population here, right? And so what patroon are you sitting on their land? <laughs> Rensselaerwick, <laughs> right? We say Rensselaer. Right? I'm proud of saying Rensselaer. I just had the Dutch Consulate General correct me. <laughs> it is Rensselaer. Okay? 
It was one of the first, and it was the last. Most of the patroons did not survive. By the time the British came over, that's okay. We have one of those medieval systems too. They were called manners. And we're going to introduce the manners and the patents, and we're still going to give people who've already purchased their land, give us a little bit more money towards the crown, we will allow you then to become lord of the manor of your lands. There are 18 manors in New York. And they are very, very important. They are the size of plantations. The official definition of a plantation, a large farm, a large tract of land worked as one farm with a resident labor force. Think Mount Vernon, George Washington's house, right? 50,000 acres, a large farm. Resident labor force, 317 enslaved people. Worked as a single unit. Here in New York, comparable size, Phillips Manor. 52,000 acres. Spite and Devil Creek, just off of Manhattan, all the way up to the Croton River. From the Hudson River over to the Bronx River. The family built two houses. One on the Nepperhan, now called the Sawmill River, in Yonkers. The other one about 20 miles north on the Botanico River, now called Phillipsburg Manor Upper Mills. Around the house in Yonkers, they can control 300 acres. Around the house in Sleepy Hollow, they control 500 acres. The rest of the acreage was broken into small farms and leased to northern European tenants. It was not worked as a single farm. It's all of these little bitty farms. But they are answerable to the manor lord. He sets the terms of the lease. You grow what I say, you use only my mills, and I'll give you some money to get you started. Right? This is one of the reasons why, when we talk about enslavement in New York, that many people say, oh, there weren't that many slaves here, which is not true. Because we're so accustomed to looking at the plantation and that big chunk of enslaved people as one unit. Here, we've got 20 at the house in Yonkers. We've got another 23 up in Sleepy Hollow, but on every one of those individual farms. You've got one over here, you've got two over here, you've got another three or four over here. You add them all up, you get your hundreds. The matters will go anywhere from 50,000 acres, Russell Arrowick, almost a million. So when you think about the people, that's where that comes in. The Dutch were traders. In British thought, wealth is connected to land ownership. The more land you have, the more power you have. The Netherlands is smaller. It's not connected to land. It's connected to trade. And they're not locally trading. This is a nation built of ocean-going merchant traders. And they bring that here to New Netherland. They own this land, but they're not really that involved for a long time in how well it is being developed. They're looking at what natural resources can we get from this land and put on the world market. The first of those, of course, is fur. Because, you know, they've killed all their beaver and deer and everybody else. But when it starts running low, they have to come up with other things. First, they're going to start tapping into that Virginia tobacco. 
And then they're like, okay, well, we got all this land. We've got to do something with it. And that's when they start growing wheat. So this is a quote out of a very wonderful, very thick book, Dr. Simba Kim. Unlike the English who equated ownership of land with status and wealth, well-to-do Dutch merchants did not try to buy social position by acquiring a country estate. The possibility that with an increase in population, <coughs> excuse me, these lands would someday become valuable failed to steer them into land speculation. The wealth of most affluent New York Dutch in the 1650s and the 1660s consisted in the ownership of boats, the building of mills and breweries, and well-located lots on Manhattan Island. But that did not negate up here, because we have the same thing, right? You've got the farms, they're growing wheat, they're into the trade, the breweries are here, and yeah, I guess we gotta get some more people. So the initial people who actually come to settle New York through the Netherlands are not necessarily Dutch. They come through the Netherlands. The first are the French Walloons, right? Religious persecution is a major player happening in Europe right now. So you have the pilgrims hanging out in the Netherlands for a long time before they come here. You have Scots-Irish with all of the Protestant stuff happening. They're going to go there, and then they're going to come here. So a lot of people are coming here through the Netherlands because life in the Netherlands is good. And they're like, wow, why should we give all these other people there? But eventually the Dutch do start coming, particularly those working for the Dutch West India Company in the lower position. So many of the founders of some of the wealthiest families in New York history started as carpenters, started as soldiers, started in some other capacity working for the company, came, got involved in the fur trade, got involved in the tobacco trade, slowly, amassing land after the natives are pushed off or killed off by disease. So it's slowly growing. It takes a while, but not that long. So why does it take us this long to learn about all of this, though? Why has the Dutch history been so deeply hidden? Because nobody can speak the language. Nobody can read the documents, except for one guy, Dr. Charles Gary. If you have not heard from him, about him, please go to the New Netherland Institute's website and read Dr. Gary's story. Has his PhD, needs a job. Knocks on the door of the New York State Archives and they go, oh yeah, we have this great project for you. And so they get in touch with Nelson Rockefeller who comes up with funding and some of the Dutch society support that funding. And for the last 35, almost 40 years, Dr. Gehring has had a singular job. Translating thousands of pages of Dutch documents related to New Netherlands that were housed at the New York State Archive. For a while, Dr. Jana Venema joined him. She recently retired within the last two years and returned back to Holland. We owe him a lot. A lot. He was kind enough. I'm working on an exhibit at Phillips Manor Hall in Yonkers, and we had one of the documents from the archive as a piece of art. Because the wonderful thing about, or the sad thing about these documents, visually they look really interesting because the edges are burned. Back in some years ago, there's a major fire at the New York State Archive. And on top of those documents were a lot of documents related to New York early colonial history. We lost a couple of censuses in there. But they fell on the Dutch documents. 
So they were, the Dutch documents were actually protected by the burned British documents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they had, and it's amazing. He's translated three volumes, and right now they think there will be a total of ten. A total of ten. And they're all legal documents, things that tell us so much about how things were going on. So we have this New Netherland tucked right here in the center. Now we're here to talk about food, right? So where do we start talking about New Netherland food with this guy? Who I have been jonesing over Andrew and Vanderdog for years. He came here as the stout, the sheriff for Rensselaerwick. He was the only lawyer in the entire colony. He fell in love with this area. He was supposed to stay near the people and work as a sheriff. Now, where was this man? He was off hiking. <laughs> he was up in the hills. He was meeting the natives. He was learning their languages. He was like just listening what was in the rivers, what was in the woods, and just everything, right? Just kept writing. Except, you know, he also got an eye for the owner's wife. <laughs> so, when one of the rascal heirs died, he had to go. So he went down to New Amsterdam and immediately started butting heads with Peter Stuyvesant. Right? So he and a couple of other of uh, the the men of nine, the council who kind of ran things, went to um, the Netherlands, to The Hague, to present grievances against Stuyvesant. They got approved. And then the English and the Dutch got into a war. And he got stuck there for two and a half, almost three years. They wouldn't let him leave. So while he was there, he took all of his love for the colony and wrote a sales pitch. It is a straight up sales pitch. Trying to get people to come populate New Netherland. Throughout that book, he talks about what is native to the area, what foods the colonists bring in, he talks about what the natives are eating, how they're eating it, what they're doing. We learn so much baseline about what is native to New York. And it's like all through. He just weaves it all through. So I actually have a three-page document where I've gone through, read the book, and typed it all out. And this is just a portion, right? Maize and beans. We've got these blue grapes, right? Our Concord grapes, right? They're native. We got strawberries and blackberries and blueberries, raspberries, some kind of cherry. We got gooseberries and hazels, acorn, black walnuts, chestnut, black currants, plums, a small kind of apples, pumpkins, black caps, artichokes, right? Sunchokes, wild onions. And, and then he goes all through all the fish. He goes through all the different kinds of shellfish. He goes through all the different kinds of edible and not edible animal life, right? And then he tells us what's introduced. Various kinds of salads and cabbages, carrots, beets, endive, sorrel, dill, spinach, radishes, parsley, several herbs of all kinds, rosemary, lavender, hyssop, thyme, sage, margarine, artichokes, cardoons. I've recently seen someone using cardoons as yard art. Does anyone know what a cardoon is? Mm -hmm. Right? This is a beautiful plant. It looks like celery on steroids. <laughs> and you eat the stalk, right? Asparagus, cucumbers, peas, and varieties of sorts of beans, rye, barley, melon, wheat. Some days he just goes, you know, there's just so much in a kitchen garden that I just don't even pay attention. He lists out more different varieties of fruits and vegetables than I can find in any grocery store today. 
So where do you want to start? This is where you start. Read that with all. The next source, also period. We owe a lot to a wonderful culinary historian. Her name is Peter G. Rose. She is a Dutch, she's Dutch. I've known Peter 20 plus years. The sensible cook was part of a larger book brought here in the 17th century called The Pleasures of a Country Life. And that bigger book was made up of how-to books about how to set up a farm, how to run a farm, how to run an estate. It talked about butchering, it talked about beekeeping, it talked about, you know, how to set up a wood pile, and just like all those basics. And in that is this cookbook. All of those books had been published separately in the Netherlands. Then they were bound in this book, and we have several artifact copies of that book gained from the 17th century in artifact collections, one of which is Historic Hassan Valley in Westchester, another one's down at New York Historical Society. I don't know if they have one up in the archives. Okay. But these recipes are straight out of the Netherlands. Straight out of the Netherlands. Another book, and I have these back here. Please don't walk away with my books. Peter Rose did an exhibit a few, years, a number of years ago, called "A Matter of Taste." She did that with um, Albany Institute of History and Art. They looked at Dutch master paintings that had American food in them, right? So you can look at the golden period of Dutch art and see pumpkins and squash and turkeys and sunchokes and all of these things, right? One of the things that happens during this period of colonization that is happening across the world, we have two of the largest movements of food that in human history, period, human history. The first is the Columbia Food Exchange, based on Columbus. And all those people who came right after him, right around the time he came. Because they come, yeah, they're looking for, uh, first to get to India, and then they get sidetracked, right, because they get something better. But they can't go back empty handed. So they have eaten all of the food from wherever they started to here, then they have to restock the ships. Right? So they're restocking both things that they have to take back to show that they actually were here, but they're also proving that the food is good because they got to eat it on the way back. So suddenly, New World foods are elsewhere. There are 300 varieties of beans, Faciolos Valgare, native to the Americas. And suddenly, they're going back. Chili peppers go back. Maize goes back. Turkeys go back. All of this stuff suddenly goes to Europe. But the dredges of those ships also are left here. Then as they're exploring around the world, they're starting to go back and forth. And the Dutch are number one about moving this material. But they're also into plant cultivation. So they actually start doing all these beautiful books and you know, growing some of these plants to put out on the world market to sell for people who have now these like, terrariums and glass houses or they want to start building things and growing things and expanding it. So this food is going back and forth. And a lot of these paintings, so as a historian, right, I'm looking at these recipes for a pie, a raised pie. What is that supposed to look like? Where am I looking? I'm looking at a painting. 
penny equivalent in time to the recipe. It is a chicken pie, actually. We'll talk about that recipe. I'll read it to you. The amount of spice is crazy. Another resource that we don't think about. The travels of Peter Carr. Again, this is a time of plants and things moving the world. So who is this guy, Peter Carr? He is an apostle. That's what Linnaeus called them, his apostles. He sent three men to different parts of the world that were being colonized. To spend some time there and check them out. But it was also about discovering the plants, the animals, but particularly the plants. Right? It is in his travels to North America, one of his landladies is Dutch, we get our first reference for a cabbage salad. Right? It was the ancestor to Colson. But it's a common dish. So some common dishes that people are so accustomed to doing don't end up in printed cookbooks. They end up in manuscript cookbooks. They end up being described in a letter to somebody. Or in this case, in Peter Carr's journal. He talks about his Dutch landlady cutting the cabbage thin. He gives you the coin wit that she's using. He talks about her using salt pepper, vinegar, and melted butter. So those kinds of references are important. Then we have the manuscript cookbooks. There are a lot of manuscript cookbooks in New York. And you can tell who's hanging out with who because they're copying each other's recipes. right? We often grew up, many of us, hearing that, well, you know, those women didn't read. Women really didn't read and write much. Some of the most literate women in the world were Dutch. And they brought that tradition of educating their sons and daughters to the new world. You have to think about it, right? Why are these Dutch women have so much like leeway? Why can they be she merchants, right? Why can they trade? Why can they do all this stuff? Well, because most of the time the guys are out on the water, and sometimes that boat does not come back. What would happen to a family? What would happen to a community? What would happen to a country if all of the power was in the hands of the men and they drowned? Who's going to pick up that business and run it? Who's going to keep things going? Right? So the choices often are based on necessity. And the necessity is Dutch women need to be literate. Dutch women need to be running businesses. Dutch women need to be doing this stuff. Because, you know, the Dutch are connected to the water, unlike the British, who are connected to the land, so they're not going anywhere, so their wives and daughters don't need to know anything. And this is really important because we have a lot of women writing. They're going to have dinner at a friend's house, she's serving a dish, what do you do? I know what I do, but for God, that's me. Right? I'm going to write it down. The manuscript receipt books tend not to have common items, right? I can make a cabbage salad. I don't need to write that down. But what were the proportions for that cake? What was the proportions for that pudding, right? If the proportion wrong, it won't set. And so we need to know things. And so there are some things that we can start tracing like when things get popular, like rice. There's a period where there are no rice recipes in the manuscript cookbooks, and then there's a plethora of rice recipes. In tandem to when Carolina gold rice was flourishing in the Carolinas and the Georgia area. Rice suddenly was an available product. Here, in the colonies. Not coming from China, not coming from Africa. Right? It was grown here. This 
is the Costello plan. It shows you the layout of New Amsterdam. There's a key that goes with it. It tells you everybody whose house and stuff. But what I want you to notice are all these gardens in the back. Right. Not only are they bringing food on these ships, not only are they bringing animals, and um, people like Rasselaer actually paid for each cow to have their own groom, each horse had their own groom, each pig had his own handler because they wanted to make sure you get a bonus if that animal is alive when he gets there. Right? So there is a lot of care. We get raised beds, we get orchards, we're starting to get all of this thing here. But we're also starting to get Dutch garden design. Through this period of the 17th into the 18th century, on some of your larger estates in Europe, there's this whole thing about garden design, right? Because these are urban people. So when you look at pictures of some of the cities in Holland, when you look at this closeness, you have the houses up to the street. But behind them, you have a private garden laid out for strolling. And in that stroll garden, you still got to have your kitchen garden. You still may have a little orchard back there. You have a place for the kids to play, all of that. So they are not just straight rows of vegetables. There are these beautiful geometric designs. All of this is happening both in Holland and again, they're transferring all of that here. So we have our ingredients. But what are they cooking on? Right? So this is the Jean Hasbrook house in New Paltz. Historic Huguenot Street, if you've never been there. What's inside? The Dutch Jarman's heart. You will find them in, again in the paintings, right? Flat wall, flat floor, chimney way above your head, but this big surface is where you're cooking. When we say hearth, many of us think just in terms of the firebox, but in fact, the hearth is the floor. Because you have a fire here, but when we hearth cook, we're not cooking, mostly we're not cooking over flame. We're burning large fires for ember. Because what do these pots have? Feet. Those feet are for spaces for embers to go under there. So you can have all of these individual stove tops. So right now, I'm in a tiny apartment in Albany, and I'm on one of those little caca apartment stoves that's like this wide, and some of my burners are like this wide, the pots are hitting each other, and you know, it's all crazy. But here, I can move this to the back, I can bring my pancake uh, skillet out, I can sit here and make pancakes, I can do a lot. So this means I can produce a lot of food per meal. Or I could also be cooking a meal and preserving food at the same time, right? Because these are farms. You don't save it, you don't have it. Not odd man out, the Van Allen house. Right? We find these all over the Hudson River and Mohawk Valley. And when we go into central New York, we have this German variation of the theme, where it's a jamless heart on the front and a small iron stove that is invented by the Germans is connected to the same chimney, heating a bedroom behind it. Right? So the jamless hearts are active for a long time in New York history. There's me working on one of those crazy things. Very few of them are now working. This is the last meal cooked on this one. It was a dinner. I did two consecutive dinners for Historic Hudson Valley for 30 people. Because the amount of flame 
the buildings themselves are artifacts. So we cannot, um, I think I just died. Oh, there we go. So we cannot risk losing the building. That's one of the challenges around live firework these days. Very few houses are doing it anymore because the artifacts, the buildings themselves as artifacts are becoming too costly. So I'm very pleased I have that privilege. So we know where they're cooking, then what is the dishes looking like? In the 17th century, it's predominantly pewter. You're going to get a lot of wooden things in there. You get some delftware. Aren't these gorgeous? Mm -hmm. This is not, you wouldn't think about this as a 17th century meal, right? We're always thinking, oh no, it's this one pot thing, it's kind of gray, you know, they were really roughing it. No, they weren't. <laughs> no, they weren't. The Dutch controlled the spice trade. They went into the spice islands, killed half the population, enslaved the rest, and took over the spice trade. And they are sending spice all over the world to this day. Of European foods, you have more variety of old world spice and Dutch food than you have anybody else. And it's because they control that trade for so long. Common ways of cooking vegetables. You boil them, you smash them to death. Right? And then we have to think about, is that why? Well, what was dental hygiene at that point, right? Right? A knob of butter. Is there wheat bread? Oh, yeah. Fine white bread. There's no roughness in this grain. They've perfected this for a long time. And those are boiled eggs in a veal meatball boiled in a butter lettuce and a broth. They're fantastic. <laughs> They're not very much, right? <laughs> Their people are not eating pottage or porridge. Right? And then we go into the English enclosed heart. The size of them is based on how big the house is. Okay. So we have the, and then the, over here in the corner, we also have the beehive ovens. Most of the beehive ovens were inside unless it was a commercial oven, and there were commercial bakers. Bread, wheat product is dominant in Dutch culture. Pancakes, waffles, wafers, ole bolen, I mean, it's just, just, just everywhere. So, this is a period where I'm very interested in and it's hard, hard to find. The period of transition. As the Dutch are gaining wealth. One of their big trade commodities are enslaved Africans. New York is the second largest slave market in the 13 colonies by the time we get to the early part of the 18th century. Notice I said market. They're not all staying here. They're coming here and being sold out. But all of this wealth means that there are a lot of women who can stop cooking, who can stop doing the laundry, who can get some help with those kids, right? But we have to consider this initial relationship. You have a woman who has now got some money and she wants out of the domestic stuff. 
right? But you've got an enslaved woman who's been on a boat in the worst possible conditions for three months. You want to talk to me about PTSD? <laughs> Language. The enslaved are renamed the moment they get off that boat. They lose their African name. So you got, you're disoriented. You're looking at a land that looks nothing like what you left. You got all of these people who look nothing like the people you left. The buildings are different. The trees are different. Somebody's yelling at you in a language you can't understand. And then let's go into the kitchen. Right? That is not an African kitchen. Ingredients? There's no wheat anywhere in West and Central Africa. You have it in North Africa, and you have it in East Africa. You have it on the edges of Africa that are connected to the Middle East where wheat is grown. They do not cook by themselves. African women cook in community, whether there's multiple wives, mamas, aunts, cousins, whoever, right? Reality versus desired myth. We don't talk about the brutality. Mm -hmm. Straight up stress. So you take the woman off the boat, you take her into this kitchen, she has no idea what it is, and you tell her to make toast. Do something simple. Make some toast. Pot of tea and toast. Okay. Not. <laughs> because most of the time when we talk about enslaved cooks, we're dumping them into the pier where they're already cooking. When we talk about women in the big houses in the South, they were already cooking, have been cooking for generations. But this is what we need to discuss. This period of transition. This is the difference. Climate is different. Tools are similar, but not. Right? Everyone's got a mortar and pestle. Everyone uses a wooden spoon. Everyone uses an iron pot, but not in the same way. Right? The room is different. Wooden benches, tables, linen, tablecloths. Linen doesn't grow in Central and West Africa, right? And everyone says, why are the Africans always sitting on the floor? Because there's a limited amount of wood, right? So your furniture is built out of what you have access to. So they don't sit on chairs, they sit on stools. Their throne is not a throne chair, it is a gold stool, right? Clash of cultures. The crops are different. The fish is different. The animals, their butchering are different. Religious tenets cause the feast to be different. Europeans are used to eating whole haunches of meat. There are very few cattle in West Africa, in Central Africa. Why? Because of the tsetse fly. The fly that controls sleep sickness. It attacks cows, it attacks horses. So you have very few cultures where those kinds of large animals are around. So they have a lot of goats. How long do I think it took for an enslaved woman stepping in that kitchen to be able to produce a meal on her own? Two years. Two years. Minimum two years. Why? Because you have to also remember preservation is happening at the same time. Right? We are lucky this year, we have a beautiful apple crop, right? Because we had no hard rain in the summer. But what if there had been rain, right? There have been recent years that our apple crop has been cut in half. 
So what if you don't have enough apples to make all of that apple cider vinegar? What if you don't have enough apples to, you know, dry for future use? Or a crop is small. So you have to learn how to do in volume. In West and Central Africa, they dry a lot of things. In the Netherlands and Europe, they're preserving in brine. That brine is either vinegar-based or that brine is salt-based. Right? They're drying stuff, right? Why do Native Americans dry so many things, right? Because they don't have salt. You don't think of it, right? Salt is imported into our area until we find the salt caverns up when they're opening the Erie Canal. So that's an important ingredient. But it's those little things that play into training someone. And then there is learning to work with wheat. How many of you bake? How many of you have over kneaded biscuits? Or beat pancakes just a little bit too long? Or made that pie crust, right? That doesn't flake, but it'll stick to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> and America's first cookbook, American Cookery, right here, New York. There are nine recipes for puff pastry. That is common pastry of the day. Not what we now make as standard pie pastry. That is not your common pastry. The common pastry is that flaky thing that you go to that specialty baker to buy because you don't have time to be messing with that stuff. Or you're one with a pepper's farm box, right? <laughs> I've already started hoarding mine for the holidays. <laughs> because last year they ran out. Hmm. Right? But those are the kinds of things that we really don't think about when we start thinking about food. Meat is a major part of the European diet. The wealthier you, wealthier you are, the more meat is on that table. Meat is, for Africans, special occasion. They're predominantly vegetarian. There are so many rivers in, in West and Central Africa, they eat a lot of fish. But if you're inland, small pieces of meat cut up in stews. That everyone has to learn how to work with maize. You could get smooth cayenne peppers, peanuts get moved. Cabbage? I'm going to think about that. Right? Cabbage is Northern European. But in fact, the Arabs are already trading with the Europeans, and so some parts of West Africa actually have cabbage before they get here. So training our slave cook, also, who are they cooking for? Are they cooking for someone who's Dutch? Are they cooking for someone who's French? Are they cooking for someone who's Jewish? They're all here in the 17th century. All these ethnic groups are here. And this is the challenge for many when we talk about the presence or absence of soul food in our area, right? Because we're not having a slave cook for themselves. Why? Because you got one person in your house, the cost of cooking. First, most of the enslaved into our area are men. Men don't cook in Africa. Talk about gender separation to this day. Right? And then the cost of food, the pot, the wood, the knives, all of that, you just going to feed them. Right? Or if you're in one of the larger houses, you're going to have your cook make some kind of soup or stew for them. Because you're going to keep them in the fields working as long as you can. So we actually have enslaved cooks and enslaved people speaking all these different languages. Because it depends on who owns them. And this goes well into the late 18th century. So John of Truth, right? Isabel Bonfrey. Most of us grew up believing that this very tall, righteous black woman was from the South. She's in fact Dutch speaking Ulster County. Her first and worst beating, she was 10 years old 
because she didn't understand English. Right? So, after the first arrivals, how do we train these cooks? I believe young girls are taken into the kitchen and they're trained starting very young. Here, go fetch water. Go do that. I, I don't know how you grew up, but that was me in my mother's kitchen. Mm -hmm. Scrub those potatoes. Empty that trash. Move this. Move that. Measure that. Particularly when you're doing the big meals. You need that help. Right? So these apprentices start happening, and these women stay in the kitchen, and then when they are traded, it's usually in a private cell. We do have cell ads for women specifically as cooks. The price is just a little bit more. Right? So wheat. All right? This is a working grist mill. On the footprint of the original at Phillips Matter Upper Mills. These mills, you know, again, that love of courier and ives, right? We're thinking small, quaint, on a river, very nice. No, 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 no. The ones at Phillips Burke Manor? One is running three sets of stones. The other one is running two sets of stones. They're making 5,000 pounds of flour a week. They're churning it out. When it is going, when these mills are going, they are going. This is product that is going down to the Caribbean, down to the West Indies, to be used to trade for things like sugar, salt, cocoa, indigo. This is major production. All of these manuscript cookbooks, we're finding all of this stuff. All wheat based. All wheat based. Then we have these you know, issues with natives, wanting the European stuff. I right? cannot. Right? New Amsterdam, 1649. Ordinance forbids selling to natives any fine boiled or white breads or cakes for presents. Right? Beverwick, same thing. You make it for us, no, you can't give it to them. Raw wheat, going to Brazil, going out. Sugar, right? So let's go back to this very early slide, because this thought happened to me this morning. And I'm thinking I'm going over my talk. The triangular trade, you guys remember that? The lasses to run to slaves. We are not distilling anything in New York other than beer. That is British. Ours, slaves and spices to wheat, to sugar. Because molasses is a byproduct of sugar production. But we never really talk about where the sugar went. Right? We talk about the molasses going to be up, you know, up to the northeast to become rum. Where's the sugar? All over New York. There's so much sugar in New York that we have letters from Europeans worried about the state of health of people who are here because the foods are so rich, right? We have beautiful soil. The fruits are rich. The plants are thriving. Vanderdark only mentions one variety of bean that doesn't make it, and that's the Windsor broad bean. Those horse beans. We don't have them here. But we've got everything else. And we have a lot of sugar and a lot of spice. So all of this plays in the face of all that mush that their those colonists were supposed to be eating. Because they weren't. So I think I have to do that slide a couple. All of these 
these different breads, all of the holiday breads, all of the speculas, all of the beautiful cooking molds we find all over the state. A shovel. I used to think those things were small. They're not. They're huge. Like many places in the world, like many commodities in the world, wheat becomes cash, right? Remember, Rome paid its soldiers with salt and onions. And so we got a lot of, that's what you get. So you can buy things for so many shovels of wheat, including a person. You can buy a house. You can pay your rent. Right? So the grain base of New York is primary. So you remember that gorgeous looking pie. One of the reasons I broke it, even though nobody was going to eat it, I just want people to smell it. So it has chicken, ripe pears, pitted prunes, dried carrot, uh, cherries, mints, citron, pine nuts, ginger, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, butter, white wine. Right? This is not a teaspoon. These spices are in that recipe in ounces. Ounces. Chicken, brought in. Pears, brought in. Right? Not native. Prune plums, short season. I hope you got some that were really good this year. Brought in. Those kinds of European cherries, brought in. Citron, whoa, yeah, that's from the Middle East, brought in. Pine nuts, brought in. Ginger, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg. To this day, we grow no spice in the United States. We're not hot enough. The closest we can get any of these old world spices were where they were moved to during the trade period, so they are in the Caribbean and West Indies. Right? Butter, dominant fat everywhere. Gotta love those Northern European cows. Right? White wine. Ooh, yeah. French, preferably. Right? So this is where we are as the British are taking over. Our cash crop is wheat. We've got two styles of hearth. The Dutch bread, cheese, beer is the base. It's so much more. They've adapted certain native ingredients. One is maize, right? Cornmeal mush. It is not the sweet corn we're eating today. It's not. That's a 20th century invention. Almost all corn is really big and dense, and it's meant to be dry. There are five kinds of, kinds of maize, but the most dominant is for the grain, and it becomes sampan. It's a cornmeal mush. And you put it on a plate, and you carve these rivers in it, and a circle in the center, you pour milk in there, and it'll go down to this little river, and everyone shares that dish. Right? And squashes use the pancakes. So they're adapting. Right? Transitions in the hearths. Remember I said depending on your wealth, right? This is a smaller one, but look at this one. This is at Van Cortland Manor down in Croton on Hudson. Right? So we have these big hearths. And we find a number of these throughout the Hudson River Valley. Moving towards a blend of Dutch and British food ways. So what happens as we go into the 18th century? Just more, more. We're going to leave pewter behind because now we get that beautiful Chinese porcelain or we have stoneware and delftware that is copying the blue and white of the Chinese porcelain. Okay, we get our first, our first cookbook. These are two editions, they're both back there. Um, historians believe she was from New York. The first one is print, the brown one is the first edition printed early in the year. 
And of course, you know, the publisher knew more than this woman. There are so many mistakes in that book. And the gingerbread has no ginger. <laughs> so it's reprinted, it's corrected and reprinted in Albany later in the year. But it's the first time we get recipes for turkey, first time we see a recipe for squash in print. We get a, a pumpkin pie recipe in there. First time the word cookie is used. Because they're called small cakes. So when you're looking at a manuscript cookbook or an old receipt, particularly 17th, 18th century, if it says cake singular, it's a risen cake. If it says cakes plural, it's a cookie. And those great nine recipes for puff pastry. And no, they are not all the same and they don't taste the same. Because the fat you use depends on whether you're going to be doing a meat pie or a sweet pie. Right? So some of them use suet, some of them use lard, some of them use butter. Things that were not around in the 18th century, right? All that, all that rice. Rice is around. There are two strains of rice in the world. One is Asian, one is African. But now it's being grown here in the Carolinas. So we have an increase in rice recipes. And there's no potatoes until we get to the middle of the 18th century. So as Peter told me more than once, a lot of them, give me a menu for 17 years of fast food with a potato on it. Okay. Not there. The Costan pot changes. In the early recipes, what would have been a potato is a turnip. And then when potatoes come in, they switch it. So this is a popular dish. So they just change the uh, vegetables. But you notice it's still all boiled and mashed up. And we got better keep. We till it's exhausted because there's no resting the land, there's no augmenting the soil. It just keeps going until the yields get smaller and smaller. What happens? Central New York opens up. Western New York opens up. So it just comes up higher into New York as the population moves. Right? The Laurel has some value to go to sheep. And then it just becomes our urban center, really. Right? 18th century. Yeah, this is pre-restaurant culture. You know, this is when dining rooms are being introduced into houses. So if you look at some of the Dutch, earlier Dutch master paintings, you'll often see people sitting at a table, but there's a bed in the back. Right? Or you'll see a lot of period furniture that folds up and makes itself smaller. Because rooms are used in multiple purposes. When you're not using the table, it's called a room at rest. You fold it up and push it to the side. You push the chairs that you're not using to the side. Right? When you need something, pull it out. You set it up. You use it. You break it down. You put it away. Right? The dishes. Getting into all that beautiful Chinese export porcelain. Meals. Breakfast. Dinner. Your main meal of the day. As we go into the 18th century, we are now setting up British Georgian culture. So what does that mean? So you're going to have a three-course dinner. Right? That seems reasonable. We have three courses now. Yes? Uh, yes and no. What we have now, what we eat, say I'm going to go out for dinner or do it in my home. You know, you start with a super salad. Then you'll have your entree, a few vegetables, bread on the side. You'll have a dessert. That is a 19th century meal. A service a la russe, service in the Russian style. The 18th century, we have service a la franchise, service in the French style. That is 5 to 21 dishes <laughs> per course. Oh so, we have this beautiful set of china back here, right? So you have that soup terrine on the second, and that will be sitting in front of the woman. That is your first remove. On that platter behind her will be in front of the man because, you know, guys, just your job to carve at 
table. Seated, please, not standing. Then it's set up just like a Georgian house. If there's a dish on the left side, it has to have a mirror dish on the right side. So that's why you have duplicates of those serving pieces. If you have another one on the left side, you have a duplicate on the right side. If you have a sauce to your left, you'll have a sauce to your right. So it's very symmetrical. The houses become symmetrical, and the way the table is laid becomes very symmetrical. Right? So you have that, and the first course is pretty savory. The soup gets removed, the lady gets a fish, then that horse, whole course goes away. The second course will repeat some of the savoriness, but then you'll start getting sweet things thrown in there. So you may have a carrot pudding on one side, but you may have a lemon pudding on the other side, right? A pudding is like a souffle. It is not that creamy thing that we're eating. It's more like a souffle. If you have a tart, that tart could be an onion tart, right? And then across from there, you can have an apple tart. Then that goes away. If you're going to do a third course, it will be even sweeter and fewer savories. Now, there's a lot of food on the table every day, and that was common. They're eating for health. It's called the humoral system. So just because all that food is cooked doesn't mean it's going to be consumed. At least, it could be at supper. It could be at breakfast the next day. But you're aiming, the cook is aiming for dinner. That's your main meal of the day. Then we have tea. Another part of history we need to correct. Afternoon tea did not start in England. It started in the Netherlands. The first shipment of tea goes to Holland. And they bring that tradition of enjoying a cup of tea with a small cake or cookie or bread and butter in the afternoon here. So if you go into any of our larger historic places like the Met, I invite you the next time you're in the Met, go to the American Wing. They have um, open cases, right? So they're just glasses and you can just see all their stuff. It is case after case after case of pewter teapots and then China teapots, and they're all from the 17th and 18th century. Right? Middling class, right? So we're starting to see the creamware coming in, but you notice there's still pewter on the table. They're stepping it up a little bit, you know, can't go that far. Right? We're still working for it. So you'll have that blend. And this is where a lot of the, the stonewares, the non-porcelainwares, are getting lighter because they're trying to copy the Chinese porcelain. It is shortly after this period that Wedgwood invents bone china. Again, trying to copy that Chinese porcelain. At the height of the period, Mahogany, the dining table, now you have a separate room for dining. You have a table out of the most expensive and prized wood in the room. And it's all reflecting the wealth. It is the porcelain, it's the polished brass, and it is all of that silver. Of course, you have those beautiful Dutch tiles, right? Magnesium, more expensive than the cobalt. Punch. Oh, punch, it is not a fruit punch. <laughs> it is an alcohol macatinese punch. And they have it everywhere. This is why there's so much drinking that happens in the 17th and 18th century. That's why in the middle of the 19th century we get such a heavy temperance movement. Right? Because everybody's drinking beer. And then we've got wine and whiskey and champagne and Madeira by the caseload. Right? 
And they're doing this all day. And that is also why drinks like tea and coffee and chocolate, hot chocolate, become so popular because it's the first time they're getting caffeine. Because they've been drugging it, and now they can up it. <laughs> Thank you. So, when did the term lunch come into effect? Lunch actually comes in in the 19th century once we go through the Industrial Revolution and people are not home for families to have dinner. So, um, it becomes a hand meal, right? Like the hand pie you got to take it with you. So dinner then starts ticking back. In my growing up, the only time that breakfast, dinner, supper was maintained was on Sunday. Because we had breakfast, then we went to church, and then we had a big Sunday dinner together. And then later, just about the time uh, Walt Disney was coming on, <laughs> there would be a light supper. And that's usually mom saying, well, whatever's left in there. You know, they may have made a little soup or you get a little sandwich or maybe whatever, like if you had turkey or a roast or something, make a little soup. But it's usually just a little nibble. Sometimes you may be able to squeeze out an extra piece of cake or pie, right? And then uh, everybody goes to bed. But that's the 19th century. We need to get people off the farm, into the factories, into industry, and then that's where that will shift. Yes, sir? When did Native American rice start being used um, by people in this area? I mean, it's Native American rice. Yeah. Wild rice. Yeah. Is not rice. Is not because it's not here. It's in Minnesota. We have some grain here that natives are collecting, but not enough to make it profitable. That is not something. It's so water edge dependent. It's so water dependent. It is never really, even to this day, it is never competing with Asian rice. They do try to grow Asian rice here. I don't know if you've ever been either to Boscobel or to West Point, but if you look at Constitution Marsh, you can sometimes be like, what are those lines over there, right? That's where they were trying to start growing European, I mean, uh, Asian rice. So, um, it's never, it's, it's just not enough. There's just not enough of that grain. It's a grass seed, actually. Um, and it has its own lifespan and things. So Native Americans, particularly as we go into the Midwest, uh, Minnesota and that whole area, are collecting a lot of the wild rice. Um, but to this day, it's never been really commercially viable to the volume that we need to really make it popular. That's why we're still paying a lot of money for Liberty Box. Mm -hmm. Yes? That vegetable that you called Cardoon? Cardoon. Mm -hmm. Could that be our native, or I don't know if it's native or not, but it could be the sticker plant? No, it's not. It's, it's very different. Um, what you're... Um, Teasel. Uh, so no. Uh, uh, so, well, like, cardoons are, are like, it literally looks like a celery stalk, and there are no stickers or anything on it, um, and it is a grayish green, and they get about this tall. I mean, they get big. Well, the wild burdock, my father-in-law used to call them. Right. There's great big stalks on it, and a big leaf. Right. I know. They used to cut off the leaves. Correct. Mm -hmm and thread them, mm -hmm. and they used to cook those and eat them. Yes, they did, and do, and so do the roots, right? You can preserve the root part if you don't, like, dig it out soon enough. You know, it's eight feet, and then it's taken over your backyard. Still digging it out. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's a different plant. And they did, yes, they did do burdock. We still do burdock. Burdock um, is more popular in Asian cooking than we do here, and more for the root than for the leaves, for the stalk. I think the Italians like that too. Mm -hmm. What about rhubarb? Is rhubarb that? It's there. 
Okay. Um, but we don't see rhubarb showing up a lot in recipes until we get into the mid to late 19th century. Okay. Now, this is one of those questions. Is it so common that nobody's writing it down? Oh. Right? When we start to see rhubarb showing up is when we are really doing more American cookbooks in the 19th century. I have not seen rhubarb show up in any of the manuscript cookbooks that I have looked at. So, but a lot of things don't show up. They show up like on the, on the garden list, but we don't see recipes for cooking them. Right? So again, when we look at the manuscript cookbooks, what are they writing down? They're writing down the specialty dishes where they have to remember the proportions. So we find more cake recipes, more specialty pudding recipes, but the things that I would consider a pie filling or a cobbler filling, we're not finding those because everybody knows how to do it. Right? You, you will find the recipe for the crust, like how to make a short crust, but you don't find the filling. Rhubarb was great to see in the spring because it was one of the first vitamin C mm -hmm. crops. So yes. So our dandelion, right? Yeah. The dandelion is brought here, rhubarb is brought here. But we don't have, um, so far, I have not found any recipes for it. But there's a lot of manuscript cookbooks and a lot of papers still in the book. New York is still real deep in the paper. We don't have a lot of books. And that's one of the challenges that we have is that um, we're still doing a lot of primary document research. So we know that with um, enslaved people in the South, some of their foodies crept into what they cooked for right. the big house. Um, do we ever see that really happening? No. Up north, not really. And, and so this is a, no, I, I want to say about north, I want to talk about the colonies, <laughs> right? And this is a ongoing conversation sometimes a tense one I have with some of my southern culinary historians coming in. Because if you have a lot of what happened in the big house was because behind the house you had the small African village basically. And they're cooking for themselves. Each cabin has its own hearth. They're given the supplies because you know it's different cooking for two people extra in your house and cooking for a few hundred people in your house. Right? You don't do that. You love cooking themselves. So we see what they're doing with the stuff. But when you have one person or two people, they're not cooking for themselves. And as someone, I work as a private cook. I don't care what my style of cooking is. They're paying me to cook for them. I cook how they want. And I have been challenged. Right? I mean, I had one guy who just didn't like black pepper. <laughs> it was hard, you know? And that's one of my favorite flavors, you know? I, and I know, he wasn't allergic. He just didn't like it. Right? So his wife had black pepper, and she would pepper her food. But I am cooking, prepping for them for the week. I literally had to take that black pepper and go put it in the freezer. And I had to remember to take it out before I left. Because without thinking, I would have put it in there. Yeah. All right? So if you think you're cooking, and one, if you don't get it right, what's the penalty? Right? We have to remember that in many cases, the women entertaining in our homes. We've gotten away from that. But remember, that style, even all through the 50s, you, like the, the box for dinner, right? It had to be perfect. You're having friends for dinner, because they did all the time, or you're even cooking for them. Their cook is property. She cooks the way they want it. So we just, I'm not saying it. I'm just not saying it. Where would we see it? We would see it in letters when people talk about dinners they had. We would have seen it in the journals. We would see it in the women's diaries. 
And that evidence is just not there. So I believe the enslaved cooks here, because the meals are really commented on, and they're always growing, unless somebody's a bad cook. But then what do you do with a bad cook? You just sell it. You get a dollar. Right? But they rave about the meals. And so they are copying European-style cooking. Or they're copying whatever the woman of the house ethnic that she wants to produce and serve on her table. But we don't have that here. Will we find other evidence? Maybe. I just haven't found it yet. Yes, ma'am. So has there been any research done about once enslaved communities um, were allowed to uh, own their own homes? I mean, when they were uh, manumated, so could you? And many of them married with or set up homes with Native people. Was there a, a commingling then of Native cuisines, if you want to call it that, of, you know, whatever if herbal kinds of things, gathering nuts and berries, you know, those kinds of eating habits? That those records do not exist then? so far. No. No. No research. Not necessarily no research, no records. You have Native people gone out of the Hudson River Valley by the time we get to 1725. They're gone. Right? They're, they're being pushed. They're being pushed up here. And there's a real segregation between. The enslaved would have the natives are still eating native foods. They've adopted some European foods like pig, right? They're eating certain things. But we're, I have not found any document that tells me that there's a blend there. And one of the things that we have to remember, the majority of the enslaved in New York are men. When we're, we're bringing in, and, and we're, New York is doing a lot of direct from Africa import. So if a male married a native woman, who's doing the cooking? She is. She's cooking her traditions. He's eating it because he ain't cooking. But written documents to verify what that is? No. We do have records around what the Hanadasi and the Iroquois and the natives ate and what they planted and grew and, and uh, adapted. But we don't have any of those blends. Because those who are writing on the natives aren't focused on women's work. And this comes up particularly when American corn goes to Ireland for the potato famine. Because you have Irish starving on a grain that has sustained natives for thousands of years. So why? One of the things that men didn't notice is that the women would put ash from the fire into the corn. That ash is the process of opening up the uh, skin of the corn and releasing and making available for digestion the nutrients within corn. Without the presence of that ash, that's, uh, there's a word for that process, and I'm sorry, it is not coming to mind, but it is lye. The ash is actually lye, right? And that's how we make colony, right? So that chemical transition makes corn nutrient viable. But, you know, there were men writing those things. And they weren't <coughs> washing the hands of women. They just knew that the natives lived on this grain. So we sent all this grain over to Ireland, and people literally starved on it. Because it was not opened. Those nutrients weren't opened because that ash was not put in there. Oh. Um, you did mention um, enslaved individuals with corn, or yeah. Africans, so that in the Carolinas, there's a large, you know, right, I mean, not corn, what I mean is corn, I meant rice. Rice. Right. So West Africans 
were those who were growing rice in West Africa. And yes, the Senegalians. And they were the ones that were taken intentionally to yes. do the rice uh, production in the Carolinas. Yes. So um, the rice production in the United States, would you say, is built on African technology? Yes, it is built on African technology. Because okay. the French own the land. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the French own the land. And they have, the French have no rice culture. So they went into Senegambia. So as I mentioned, there's two strains of rice in the world. One is Asian and one is African. And Africa does both upland rice, which is a dry growing rice, and they also do wet rice. But slaves were, and this happened for many industries, that the enslaved were brought specifically for a skill set. And they cleared the bogs and the bayous and the Carolinas, and they put in the rice paddies. And Carolina rice, you can still buy today, real Carolina gold rice. It is a heritage crop. Um, but yes, totally built on Africa. Yes, ma'am. The Italians are noted for pasta, the Germans for like the worst. What would you say the Dutch are noted for? Well, first of all, the Italians got pasta from the Chinese. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and a lot of the other things came from the Moors. Um, that's where we get cannolis is from the Moors. Um, what would I say with the Dutch? Butter, dairy, cheese. Yeah, I, I would have to say it's all that the flour dough things. Right? It's the pancakes, it's the waffles, it's the oil, it's the, you know, it is those dough things. I mean, the world eats pancakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how many of those long handle, there's not a historic site you can go to in our state that doesn't have those long handle pans, right? Those are for making pancakes. And we have waffle irons and waffle irons and we've got wafer irons and mm -hmm. yeah, it's all that fun work. Yes? This seems to be a many facet subject. What piqued your interest in that? I have been, um, I am that geek kid, <laughs> right? Um, I didn't grow up watching television, but you know, it was the one television in the house, right? Dad, sports, news, <laughs> do something else. Um, I spent a lot, my parents were teachers, I spent a lot of time reading. And I was fascinated by a 1950s, I grew up with a 1950s home economic book in our kitchen. So I would read the book. And then I also did learn to keep my mouth shut when I was bored, so it was like reading encyclopedia, right? Remember, we all grew up with those in the house, right? What do you do? Bored, read. Um, and I love to cook. My mother, as she said, had three daughters, one to cook, one to clean, one to sew. Um, and so it just kept going. And I could spend a lot of time, the only place I could actually just go, my parents would allow me to go, was the library. So I started reading cookbooks as books, and I still do. Um, and cooking, right? Because I thought my mother was passing on some great knowledge. It was only recently that when my siblings got together that I learned that my sister and I cooked because my mother was a horrible cook. <laughs> I didn't know that coming up. I just thought she was like giving me freedom. Um, and so I've always done that. And I've always enjoyed history and all of that. And then the New York part came in when I was 24 and I moved to New York. I volunteered at the Brooklyn Museum. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but on the top floor are all these extant rooms with houses that no longer exist. And a lot of them are Dutch. And I was like, what is all this Dutch stuff? And the, you know, the, they were like, oh, you need to go to New York Historical Society. Oh, you need to go, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, this is the wormhole, 40 <laughs> some odd years I'm still in. Mm. But it is, it's, it's very fascinating to me um, because it is so different than what we were taught. And it just opens up, particularly New York food, is, it opens up the world because the ingredients are coming from all over the world. And um, Georgian cooking, particularly mid-18th century cooking, is just phenomenal. The food is just, we eat so poorly compared to what they did. 
Pavada, thank you for joining us today. This was great. And before you all get up, there's uh, one more anniversary I forgot to mention, and Karen Hess reminded me. This week is Ariadne Queens's 350th birthday. 350th birthday. <laughs> is it she still looks pretty good for 350. Her portrait's right over there. Uh, and then in honor of that, Karen uh, was kind enough to bring some sweets for anyone who liked to partake. So they're on the table over there. So again, Lovata, thank you. And hopefully we'll see you all in November. <laughs>